So uh, this uh, talk is partly based on uh, a project uh, with uh, Peter Bellman, Chiara Demialini, Hans Franzen, uh, Vicky Hoskins, and Thomas Tahaka. Uh, and partly it is based on some wild idea that I had, and I hope that it will work out, but uh, it's more of a, like, if I get to the second part of the talk, uh, it will be more of a dreaming part than uh, uh, rigorous results. So uh, let me start with the introduction. Uh, I would like to give you a historical overview of uh, the theory of uh, moduli spaces. Uh, for curves and for uh, quivers. So uh, starting with uh, uh, vector bundles on curves, uh, one of the first results was a construction by Sashadri in 1967 uh, of the moduli space of uh, vector bundles on curves. And uh, this construction was given using GIT, GIT construction of. Of semi-stable vector bundles on curves. So I, I will, um, talk about this construction later uh, and I will explain the words. Uh, there, there, were, there was also progress uh, on this GIT construction by Mumford and Newsted and uh, they published their results later. So in 1993, well, uh, I was born, but also Faltings, uh, provided the GIT free construction. And uh, this seems to be uh, um, like, for me, it seems to be closely related to uh, the so-called strange duality, which is uh, another thing that I'm currently thinking about, but I will not talk a lot about it in this talk. Uh, and uh, later in, like way later in 2001 and 2004, uh, Popa and Esteves Popa uh, uh, improved uh, these constructions by giving effective bounds on uh, when certain line bundles are uh, become very ample or base point free. So 2001, effective base point freeness and Stavis Popa wrote a paper in 2004 on effective very ampleness. And there is a parallel story for moduli Puglia representations. So in 1994, King provided uh, a GIT construction of moduli spaces of Puglia representations. Uh, the paper is called Moduli of Representations of Finite Dimensional Algebras. Uh, and uh, he used uh, like this construction a bit more generally to uh, talk about final dimensional algebras as well. Okay, and uh, moduli uh, 
spaces of clear representations have been uh, studied a lot since then uh, using various approaches. Uh, but this year, uh, we started, uh, our group started uh, generalizing these two approaches or applying these two approaches to uh, the world of quivers. So uh, there are some results that we already have. So we have a BGIT construction beyond GIT. Uh, I will talk about it later. It is based on the theory of good moduli spaces. And the term uh, BGIT was coined by Daniel Halperin Leisner. And we also have a GIT free construction and using um, this construction was um, uh, uses the same uh, similar methods as uh, these two papers. And we expect that since we write uh, a lot of proofs using uh, explicit uh, numbers, we expect to get uh, effective very ampleness results like Estevez Popa. So classically, it is known that for cyclic quiver moduli of representations is projective, and it's been known uh, since 1994. Uh, we expect to get a new result uh, on effective bounds on when the uh, uh, on when a certain line bundle becomes very ample. Okay, so I understand that this is more of a theoretic seminar. So I'm going to uh, give uh, a bit of algebra geometric overview. And uh, if any of you become bored or if you have any questions, you can, I think you can give some reactions like, okay, if I go to participants, I think I can ask the speaker to be faster or slower, uh, maybe not. Okay, just uh, then just tell me to be faster or slower. So uh, right now I will start with uh, just defining the setup for the curve side. So first I want to define what the moduli problem uh, is, like what, what we are going to study. So the setup is as follows. X is a smooth projective curve. And uh, I would like to fix uh, an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. Okay, and I say that genus of this curve is G. Uh, genus is the dimension of global sections of the canonical sheaf. So this is the cotangent sheaf. Uh, or by third duality, it is the same as uh, the dimension of the first cohomology of the structure sheaf. I view vector bundles as locally free sheaves. And uh, locally free coherent sheaves. And I denote the category of coherent sheaves on X by co X. So this category has homological dimension one.
because uh, x is dimension one. So uh, all x groups starting from the second vanish. Uh, I will define Euler characteristic of a sheaf in a familiar manner. It will be the dimension of the global sections of this sheaf minus the dimension of the first cohomology. And uh, using the similar Okay, using Euler characteristic, I can define Euler pairing. Uh, it will be denoted by angular brackets. Euler pairing between E and F can be calculated as home, a dimension of the home space from E to F minus the dimension of the X space from E to F. So, I can also write it as the Euler characteristic of the uh, complex of vector spaces are home from E to F. Or if I understand that uh, all functors that I write are derived, I can write E comma F as the Euler characteristic of E dual tensor F. So here, both of these operations are derived. Uh, by Riemann Rock, we can uh, write an explicit formula for this pairing. So we can write it as rank E degree F minus rank F degree E plus rank times rank times one minus genus. And uh, since uh, I said that we that, that I want to classify uh, certain objects, I want to like in order to get any kind of finiteness results for the moduli space, I want to uh, fix a numerical characteristic. So I want to fix uh, rank and degree. Uh, so how do I fix uh, numerical invariants? Uh, so usually I think of numerical invariants as a uh, K zero group. So like zero is K theory. K theory. So K zero of X is defined as K zero of the abelian category co X. And uh, we know that it is as, a billion, as an abelian group, Z plus uh, the Picard of X. And we can define a churn character from this group to uh, homology of uh, X. So if X were over C, then we can define homology H0 plus H2. It would be Z plus Z. Uh, if uh, if X is not necessarily over C, we can define topological K-theory, it will uh, still recover the same Z plus Z. So let me just write Z squared here. And I, so I imagine that uh, uh, many of you know uh, that churn character may have uh, rational coefficients. So it, it can have denominators. But in the case of curves, it doesn't because our uh, churn character starts with rank plus C1 without denominators. So just sending it to rank and degree. Uh, it gives me such a group homomorphism. So there is still a problem though. Uh, if I fix rank R and degree D, then the moduli problem 
of uh, vector bundles on X of uh, these rank and degree. is uh, still unbounded. Uh, which means that uh, we don't have a finite type K scheme that, uh, uh, that parameterizes all of those. So, uh, so this is true for R greater than one. So for example, uh, we can have when rank is equal to two and degree is equal to zero, then we have uh, the following family of vector bundles O of minus point plus O of, sorry, O of minus N points, um, points plus O of N points. And uh, here M can vary over all natural numbers and it uh, defines for us uh, something that is not of finite type. So the solution is to uh, get rid of those possibilities where we can split our vector bundle into two uh, simpler pieces. And so we restrict to semi-stable vector bundles. And in 1994, Lepotier and Simpson showed that uh, this moduli problem is bounded. Okay, so what is semi-stability? So when E is a coherent sheaf of positive rank, I define the slope of this sheaf as degree divided by rank. And I say that E is a slope semi-stable if for any proper sub-object I have that the slope of this sub-object is at most the slope of E. And there is uh, a modification of this property. It is slope stable. If for every proper sub-object, this is strictly smaller. Uh, in other words, if we have equality of slopes, then it means that E prime is either zero or E itself. So uh, a couple of examples are first that line bundles are always stable.
because uh, when we have a sub object inside the line bundle, it is either zero or a line bundle of smaller degree. We cannot have a morphing from a line bundle of larger degree to a smaller degree. And uh, if we have a stable coherent sheaf, stable or semi-stable, then its twist by a line bundle is also stable or semi-stable respectively. Also, I just uh, want to make a quick remark that um, since on curves, any coherent sheaf uh, can be written as a direct sum of a vector bundle uh, plus some torsion sheaf. We can notice that uh, stability or semi-stability implies that there is no torsion. So uh, when we have uh, any sort of semi-stability, it automatically, E automatically becomes a vector bundle. Can you say why that? I mean, you, you define the slope only for uh, rank non-zero stuff. Um, yes, I, I guess I can say that, um, when rank is zero, uh, the slope is infinity. Well, it's plus infinity. Uh, yes. So uh, even if the degree is uh, negative, then your loss is plus infinity, right? So in this case, uh, on curves, the degree cannot be negative uh, because uh, for uh, so let, let's consider this example. So what are torsion sheaves? They are skyscraper sheaves or like some extensions of skyscraper sheaves. So degree of a skyscraper sheaf is one. So if you have any torsion sheaf, its degree can uh, its degree is positive. Is it also true that uh, over over all schemes, not necessarily one dimensional, you have that all semi stable coherent sheaves are vector bundles, or is it not true? No. Uh, no. Uh, so even over surfaces, uh, this is like this definition is. Uh, uh, should be modified to eliminate um, certain bad quotients. So like over surfaces, uh, stability is better defined in terms of quotients. And uh, for example, if there are Hilbert schemes, they classify ideal sheaves and ideals of points on surfaces are not vector bundles. They are not locally free. Any other questions? Okay, so- uh, Sorry, really also- uh, do you also need to uh, consider something else other than slope for surfaces? Like, is uh, it? Yeah, there are there are uh, various approaches. So there is slope stability, which is uh, defined with respect to a polarization. So instead of writing degree, we don't know what a degree of a line bundle on the surface is, but we can intersect this line bundle with an ample line bundle, and then we get a number and this is called degree. So this is one approach. And another approach is uh, Gizekar stability when you uh, compare uh, Hilbert polynomials asymptotically. I see that it's still always like 
Mm, only one number. Uh, Hilbert polynomials have uh, three numbers on surfaces because they are degree. They can be degree two. Uh -huh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Okay. Um, like for now, we are in a very sim uh, in a very simple situation where uh, homological dimension is one, and we don't care about polarization or like anything like that, and Hilbert polynomials. Um, okay. Uh, so let me uh, list several properties of uh, slopes. Okay, so let me consider a short exact sequence of uh, vector bundles. Then the slope of F. So by definition, it is degree over rank, but uh, it can be uh, defined in terms of uh, the slopes of E and G as uh, their kindergarten uh, sum of fractions. So it will be degree E plus degree G over rank E plus rank G. And uh, this formula implies uh, two um, uh, arithmetic corollaries. So if two of the three have equal slope, then the third has the same slope as well. And also comparing slopes of uh, sub bundles is equivalent to comparing uh, slopes of quotient bundles. Furthermore, uh, and here uh, in these properties actually use that K is algebraically closed. Let me fix a non-zero morphism from uh, E to F. So not necessarily an injection, just anything non-zero. Like proper, like this is the first set of properties. This is the second set of properties. So if both E and F are semi-stable, then their slopes, uh, then the slope of E is at most the slope of F. And uh, this should follow from uh, roughly this observation, plus considering uh, image as a sub-object of F and uh, image as a quotient object of E. And I guess I can leave it as an exercise because uh, if you've never seen it, then this is a very satisfying uh, thing to check your, uh, yourself. If you've seen it, then you'll be bored. So if E and F are stable, and of the same slope, then F is an isomorphism. And finally, E 
if E is stable, then it is strongly simple. Are these results only true for vector bundles or do they also hold more generally for coherent sheaves? Uh, these all hold for coherent sheaves uh, over algebraically closed field. Uh, not necessarily over curves, over uh, higher dimensional varieties as well. Okay. Are there any other questions? It's not sure uh, that it's uh, non strongly simple over non algebraic closed fields. Or is it? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know examples. But I imagine that uh, I imagine that there might be uh, such examples. So Like endomorphisms of a certain of, of a certain stable object uh, can be a division algebra or something. Yeah, this is fine. It will still be simple, right? If it's a division uh, algebra. Stable. Oh, it will still be simple. Or will it not? Okay, my question was: is it true over any field that a stable vector bundle is necessarily simple? not necessarily strongly simple. So that, and E oh. is a division algebra always. Well, uh, it is not true that E is, that E stable implies E simple. Because okay. for example, for line bundles, uh, you can embed a line bundle of a smaller degree inside uh, yours. And this will be a sub object, which is not zero and not itself. Ah, 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 I, I, I got it. But the endomorphism algebra is always a division algebra, nevertheless. Yeah, I think, okay. uh, yeah. Okay. So um, it is a division algebra by the second property, pretty much. So because every non-zero morphism is an isomorphism. So you can find an inverse. Okay, uh, Eldon, did you understand Vava's question, or should I say what I what I just answered? Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, this is the GIT construction. Uh, first given by Sishadri and uh, then explained in Mumford, Newstead, and uh, there is a book by Herbert Slen, uh, which uh, generalizes this construction for higher dimensional varieties as well. Uh, I, will only, uh, I will only give a sketch of this construction. And so the construction takes uh, four steps. So in the first step, we consider just any vector bundle over our curve. And let's say that I want to fix rank R 
and degree d. Then f is a vector bundle uh, of a given rank and degree. And uh, let's say that uh, the degree is sufficiently large. So degree e is larger than rank times 2g minus 1. Then if f is semi-stable, then uh, Riemann rock uh, implies that h1 of f is zero. So I can say that uh, Euler characteristic of f is equal to h naught of f. And let me denote this number by n capital. And moreover, F is generated by global sections. So what that means is that we have a natural morphism from global sections of F tensor O to F. And uh, this morphism is surjective. Okay, so now in the second step, I want to talk about all vector bundles of uh, this rank and degree, like degree sufficiently large. And I say that I, I fix a vector space V of dimension M. By what we uh, just stated in uh, step one, for every f vector bundle of rank r and degree d, there exists a surjection from v tensor ox to f. And uh, the, uh, these surjective morphisms are parameterized by uh, a subset of the so-called code scheme. I are parameterized by So like this is uh, a scheme parameterizing quotients of this sheaf and it was proved that uh, it is representable by a projective scheme. In the third step, we describe uh, when these vector bundles are semi-stable, like when the quotients are semi-stable. And I pick those bundles, like those quotients, uh, for which F is semi-stable, which is an open condition. And this surjective homomorphism induces uh, an isomorphism of uh, global sections. So 
So this is also an open condition because uh, dropping of rank is uh, a closed condition. Therefore, maximality of rank is an open condition. Now, uh, I would like to say that uh, this Q semi-stable over parameterizes uh, stable uh, semi-stable vector bundles. So in the fourth step, I observe that these two quotients are isomorphic as vector bundles. If and only if there is, there is a change of coordinates G in GLV uh, that makes uh, the following diagram commute. Like V tensor OX to F to F prime. This should be an isomorphism. And this is G tensor identity on the structure sheaf. So this diagram commutes. So the upshot is that the moduli space of semi-stable sheaves of rank R and degree D is Q semi-stable mod SLN. And I only have SLN here and not uh, GLN. Like, let me write SLB because uh, I can mod out by, uh, uh, because I don't care about the action of uh, scalar matrices. So uh, if I have a matrix that, that is changed by a scalar, so if I have lambda G here, then this uh, morphism can also be scaled by lambda. And in this case, F and F prime are isomorphic as quotients and not just as uh, sheaves abstractly. Okay, so here are the properties of uh, this GIT construction. So first of all, what we get is a projective scheme. Now, Sorry, if I say that. I say that, okay. yeah, um, <clears throat> that the GM, that, that the diagonal matrices act as, uh, act, well, they act trivially, and so we don't have to consider them in the GAT question. Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, and let me quickly mention that, um, so here I assume that degree is sufficiently large. So what happens if it is not? Notice that uh, if we have a stable sheaf, it is uh, stable, like even only if it's twist by a line bundle stable. So we twist F by a sufficiently uh, large degree line bundle. We, uh, it does not change the moduli problem, but for this twisted moduli problem, we repeat these four steps. Okay, so, uh, the restriction on the degrees is um, not uh, like, does not make us lose the generality. Okay. So the resulting scheme is projective. If uh, GCD of R and D is one, so if uh, rank and degree are co-prime, then uh, stability is equivalent to semi-stability because we cannot uh, make, so like if we have degree over rank, we cannot find uh, smaller numbers d prime and r prime such that uh, this is equal to d over r. So stability is equivalent to semi-stability. In this case, uh, this scheme is also smooth. And the tangent space at a line bundle E is 
isomorphic to X1 from E to E. And if GCD is not equal to one, then the moduli space can be singular. And people do a lot of interesting algebraic geometry with uh, those singularities. Okay, are there any questions about this construction? Okay, then uh, let me talk about refinements of this construction. So as I mentioned, faultings uh, gave a JIT free construction of this. So this is also called a duality construction. So let me now say that M denotes this moduli space. And I want to fix a vector uh, inside K theory and, and L. And I just want to remind you that uh, this vector can be thought of as rank and degree uh, and rank and a line bundle. And n is positive. I want it to be such that for every e in m, the Euler pairing from e to V is equal to zero. Okay. Then I can define uh, a determinantal line bundle from V uh, as follows. So let's let U be a universal bundle on M cross X. So for each point of M, the restriction on this fiber uh, is isomorphic to the sheaf that corresponds to this uh, point of M. Then I can define theta v as the determinant of the derived push forward of u tensor q upper star of v. Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, if I have a K theory class, uh, then derived functors, so like all of those, are derived. Derived functors uh, induce homomorphisms on uh, K0. So this gives me a K theory class uh, over this variety. Then uh, I, I get a derived tensor product with U, which gives me a K theory class still on this variety. And I can push forward this uh, K theory class on M. So uh, this whole gadget lives in K zero of M. And now determinant is a homomorphism from K zero to uh, Picard of M. So what I get in the end is a line bundle on M.
So what Faltings did is uh, uh, he proved uh, the following two results. So first, E, a vector bundle on X is semi-stable if and only if there exists uh, a non-zero vector bundle uh, such that there are no homes or X from E to F. And uh, furthermore, um, theta v, and I think I should uh, dualize it here. Uh, theta v is ample, and it is called a theta line bundle. So this is a proof of projectivity without using uh, the properties of GIT. And uh, Estevez Popa, uh, said that now let's uh, fix a determinant. So now M has a fixed determinant L. Sorry, uh, a small question. Is it difficult to see, say, the first claim of the theorem? It is not entirely clear. Uh, so, Shadri, so, so I personally find it hard to read Faulting's papers. So, um, uh, there is a nice uh, proof of uh, this result by Nori in an appendix of uh, Shishadri's paper. Um, if you want, I can give you then, like, I can look up the name of the paper. No, I guess I, I can find it by myself. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so uh, now the 2004 uh, refinement uh, of uh, on ampleness. So, when we consider the subscheme of MRD, uh, where we fix determinant, it uh, has been known that the Picard of M is Z. And I let uh, uh, curly L be the ample generator. So it is called determinant line bundle, and it can pretty much be obtained from uh, this data uh, as this data view. Then uh, the theorem that Stavis Popo proved is that for every M uh, greater than or equal to R squared plus R, the M's power of L
uh, separate points. And uh, it also separates uh, tangent vectors on the smooth locus. So they wrote that uh, they couldn't prove that it is very ample on the whole M because they could not get a hold of uh, the tangent uh, space on the uh, singular locus. But in particular, if GCD of R and D is one, then M is smooth and therefore LM is very ample. So this is because of this GIT result. Okay, and uh, now I think I would like to go back to the introduction and see that we talked about the first column and I can start talking about quivers. This is taking longer than I expected, but I think uh, this is what usually happens during every talk. Okay, so uh, now I want to fix a quiver and uh, I take the category of uh, representations of Q. Uh, without relations. So for any quiver, a cyclic or not a cyclic, uh, without relations, the category of all representations has a uh, homological dimension one. And there is a fun example when Q is a quiver with uh, two loops, then the path algebra is uh, the free uh, non-commutative algebra on two generators. So this still has homological dimension one. But uh, when Q is acyclic. And I want it to be acyclic for uh, until the end of the talk. Then uh, I can describe uh, simple objects in uh, the uh, in the category of representations. So now uh, when I say a simple object as opposed to strongly simple, it means that uh, there are exactly two sub objects. Zero and itself. Uh, 
So simple objects in this sense are in bijection with vertices. Uh, how come? Uh, when I have a vertex i, the associated simple si uh, has one dimensional uh, vector space over the vertex i and uh, zero everywhere else. And each representation V admits a filtration uh, whose associated graded factors are sums of these symbols. So for example, uh, we can uh, start doing this filtration by uh, considering a sink um, I. So it is a vertex such that it doesn't have any outgoing arrows. Then we can take uh, the vector space at this vertex, oh, sorry, V of I tensor SI. It will be a sub representation of V and uh, co kernel is uh, concentrated on a smaller quiver or like on a sub quiver. And so on the support of this uh, co-kernel, we can uh, find its own things and continue the construction. So um, the upshot is that SIs, form a basis in case theory. In case zero of uh, finite dimensional representations of Q. So it can be identified with uh, Z to the power of Q naught. And uh, a, in a similar fashion as with curves, we want to fix a certain numer numerical characteristic uh, and fixing a K-theory class e, uh, of, uh, Q of a Q representation is the same as fixing a dimension vector. And this is because if dimension of V is equal to G, it is the same as saying that the class of V, since we uh, wrote it in terms of uh, extensions of VI tensor SI and like these co kernels, it is the sum of DI times SI. And as before, we have Euler pairing from K naught of rep Q.
to z. And it is now degenerate. Okay, so uh, King's GIT construction. Uh, starts with uh, the following abstract definition. He wants to treat uh, uh, representations of quivers uh, as objects in a certain category and define stability on this category. So let's now A be an abelian category and theta from K naught A to R, or I guess in our case, it would be to Z, an additive function It is called a character of A. Is it like the stability condition thing for T structures and and like, oh, like for tranquility categories? It's it's yeah. different. It's not this yeah. kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. So, um, bridge and stability condition uh, satisfies this uh, barycentric property that. Uh, I mentioned like this uh, silly addition of fractions property. So like <laughs> the smart uh, name for this property is barycentric, I think. Um, uh, but this is, uh, this character is not normalized. So it is hard to compare. So when you talk about stability and semi-stability with respect to this character, you really want your objects to pair as zero with theta. So uh, here is the definition. I say that V in A is uh, theta semi-stable. If and only if theta of V is zero. And for every sub object V prime in V, theta of V prime is at most theta of V. And I say that it is uh, theta stable. If and only if, if and only if it is theta semi stable and for every sub object equality of uh, uh, this character implies that v prime is equal to zero or v And uh, this is important that uh, theta of V is required to be zero because it can, uh, because we don't uh, divide by any sort of rank function. And there are refinements of this uh, character when uh, I think Marcus Reinecke worked with uh, those when when we take theta uh, slope of V is equal to theta of V divided by the sum of dimensions. But uh, I would not like to go into that direction yet. So we are still in a uh, simple-ish situation. So uh, I just want to make a quick remark. Uh, if you read uh, King's paper, uh, modular representations of finite dimensional algebras, he uses opposite sign here, uh, but the sign convention has uh, later been changed in several papers, for example, in Vicky Hoskins papers. 
And uh, this new sign convention was, ab was adopted to enhance the parallel with uh, the slope stability for uh, vector bundles on curves. So like for vector bundles on curves, we also had this uh, less than or equal to inequality. Okay, so now fix a dimension vector D in K0 of Q. Q is uh, a cyclic. Fix vector spaces Vi of dimension Di. Uh, then I want to construct the moduli space of Kuva representations of this dimension as a certain quotient. So take the affine space R, will be the direct sum of comes from Vi to Vj, where the sum is taken over all arrows. And this uh, affine space over parameterizes the quiver representations because uh, they are given by uh, precisely taking, fixing certain uh, homomorphisms from Vi to Vj. So like I'm thinking of it in a stupid way as of matrices. But these matrices can define uh, isomorphic uh, represent Q representation structures. Uh, this happens when there are uh, morphisms from VI to VI and VJ to VJ that make this diagram compute. So I consider these matrices, like quote unquote matrices, up to the action of all GLVIs. So up to changing all, all the coordinates in this uh, quiver. And I can notice as before that uh, the diagonal, like one dimensional diagonal subgroup acting by scalars doesn't change anything. Because when we take conjugation, uh, action by scalars uh, cancels, cancels out. Okay, now if I am given a tuple of number, numbers, I can define, first of all, the character on the category of representations. And you can imagine how it acts. Uh, it takes a weighted dimension vector of V, theta i times dimension of V. Uh, furthermore, these uh, theta i's give a character of our group G. Where G goes to the product of determinants of G i's to the power of theta i's. Sorry, 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 I'm a bit lost. So G is, is the product of G, GLVIs. And what is mm -hmm. Delta? Uh, delta is uh, the one dimensional subgroup of scalars. Ah, so it's like the center, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, wait. Smaller than center. Yeah, smaller than the center. Yeah, okay. Uh huh. So we take the quotient. Ah, uh ah. -huh. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, now I 
uh, given uh, a tuple of numbers, I can define first a character of uh, an abelian category of this abelian category, and uh, second, second uh, a character of our group G. And uh, given a character of uh, the group, it gives me uh, a condition for GIT stability on R. So theta gives me theta semi stability on R. And chi theta gives me GIT stability on R. So there are two ways in which I can pick semi-stable locus inside of R. So a proposition which uh, King proves uh, using uh, Hilbert Mumford criterion is that these two criteria of semi-stability coincide. So R theta semi-stable, so let me move it a bit lower, is uh, the same open locus as R chi theta semi-stable. And then using GIT, we can take a quotient of this uh, object. So the GIT quotient of R with respect to chi theta by quotient by G is uh, defined as uh, taking the semi-stable locus, uh, GIT semi-stable locus, and taking its quotient by G. And it is going to be a quasi-projective variety. But uh, in the case of acyclic rulers, in fact, a projective variety. Uh, a projective variety. So, and this object classifies Theta semi-stable Q representations up to S equivalence. Uh, yeah, it's not always smooth. Uh, so the same thing happens as uh, for curves. Um, When Q is acyclic, it is a projective variety. When uh, Q has cycles, it will be a projective over affine variety. Uh, and again, if uh, D is an indivisible vector, then stability and semi stability coincide. And uh, so the, lo the locus of like the space of stable representations is uh, parameterized by a smooth uh, projective variety. Okay, so this was uh, King's construction. Now I am going beyond GIT. Uh, okay, I asked about whether I should define quivers. Maybe it's time to ask whether I should define uh, algebraic stacks. Are you smiling because it is yes or because it's obviously no? I think it is no. Okay. I think no. Okay, so um, then uh, 
I want to uh, cut to the cut to the chase immediately. Uh, so the following definition was given by Jared Alper in his thesis, and it is the following: Let X be an algebraic stack, and X an algebraic space. And we say that a morphism phi from curly X to straight X is a good moduli space. If first uh, the non-derived push forward from Q call X to q call x straight is exact. And second, uh, the non-derived push forward of the structure sheaf of x is canonically isomorphic to Ox via the uh, uh, adjunction morphism. Okay. And now uh, I always like to say it because uh, it breaks almost everyone. So uh, phi lower star being exact does not mean that uh, does not mean that there are no higher derived functors. So there, uh, in certain cases, uh, phi lower star can be exact, but there will still be a, a higher derived push forward, and this is because derived push forwards are taken not on this category, but on a larger category. And on a larger category, this may not be exact. So a couple of examples. Um, so the first is a GIT example uh, when G is a linearly reductive group. Uh, if, the, if if our field of, is characteristic zero, then it is the same as reductive, acting on a variety X, which is affine. Then uh, we can consider X mod G like uh, the spectrum of uh, G invariants, it will be a good quotient in the uh, classical moduli theory sense. And uh, in the stacky world, it means that if we take the stack quotient X mod G, then X mod G going to X mod G is uh, a good moduli space. And many people usually uh, abbreviate good moduli space to GMS. In this case, P lower star, P, P, P lower star is exact. I mean, it doesn't have any Derived, higher derived functors. Uh, high lower star is always exact. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it doesn't have any derived functors in uh, this case, right? Yeah, uh, I don't think it does. Um, I, think, I think that, like, I wouldn't expect higher derived functors uh, for good moduli spaces. So uh, higher derived functors would appear if we uh, have something like uh, point going to BE. Then uh, the push forward functor is exact because uh, the category of quasi coherent sheaves on, on a point is semi simple. So every functor is exact, but there will be hard right. Right. But for, yeah, I guess maybe if you do BE to, to the point. This would also be this. This would be an example of a good model space where, where there might be 
higher drive functors, no? I don't know. Mm, I'm not sure it's gonna be a good moduli space. Because like only stacks that are locally linearly reductive, I mean, like meaning they look like this. Only, oh, only these kind of stacks. Spaces. Yeah. Yeah. And EE is not linearly reductive. Absolutely no. Okay. Okay, um, then uh, like second example, when G E is linearly reductive, then B G to a point is a good moduli space. And uh, again, if, so like, GM is a linearly reductive group. Uh, then AM plus one mod GM has a good moduli space, which is a point. So uh, good moduli spaces uh, are a stacky generalization of good quotients in the sense that uh, they are also uh, classifying orbits uh, that don't intersect. Okay, and AM plus one minus zero mod GM. It is isomorphic to PN. So this isomorphism is a good moduli space because PN is already an algebraic space being a scheme. So there are properties of good moduli spaces that are nice to know. So let's say that phi from X to X is a good moduli space. Then phi is surjective. Universally submersive. Uh, and phi of uh, a point P1 is equal to phi of a point P2, if and only if the closures of these points intersect in uh, the topological space of, st uh, of this stack. So uh, that is why you can see that uh, for every point in uh, this stack, a n plus one mod gm, uh, closure of any point, uh, closure of any point intersects the zero point. So uh, if there is a moduli space, a good moduli space, then it can be a point and nothing else. Yeah. Also, if uh, x is if X curl is reduced, then the good moduli space is reduced. So uh, it cannot be something like dual numbers. Okay. So now I want to define uh, stability on stacks following uh, Daniel Halpern Leisner. So let's say that curly M is uh, the stack of Q representations of dimension Z. Not necessarily semi-stable. By King's construction, I can describe this stack as 
R mod G without cogenting. So product of G L V I's. So now I want to uh, say that morphisms from a certain kind of stack, theta defined by A1 mod GM, where GM acts by scaling in a natural way. So morphisms F from theta to M correspond to filtrations of the object F of one. So uh, theta as a stack has two points. Uh, one of the points I will denote by one and it corresponds to the open orbit. And another point is in the closure of this uh, orbit and I will denote it by zero. And it looks like BGM. So I define for L a line bundle on M, I say that P is theta unstable. If there exists a morphism F, a filtration uh, F such that it is a filtration of P and the weight of the pullback of L. So the pullback of L uh, leaves on theta. And now on theta, I want to restrict it to uh, zero. So the weight is smaller than zero. So when I restrict it to zero, it becomes a, uh, a line with a GM action. And I can talk of a weight of this GM action when it is negative, it destabilizes the point. Okay, and uh, P is theta semi-stable otherwise. Okay, so a part, um, Uh, of this uh, long project is that there is a line bundle on M that uh, defines King stability. And moreover, it is constructed in a way that is similar to uh, this theta construction. So I take uh, a dimension vector that is orthogonal to uh, dimension vector D in this sense, or the pairing is zero. And uh, I take this dimension vector, I consider the trivial representation on the moduli space 
corresponding to this uh, dimension vector. And I take our homes from U to this representation. And this gives me a certain uh, complex of vector bundles on M, and then I take its determinant. So I call this line bundle, state. well, there are too many thetas. Let me call it L. Now we can use uh, the criterion of, uh, for existence of moduli spaces. Is there a motivation behind this definition of semi-stability and unstability with respect to, yeah, with respect to a line bundle? Yes. Uh, so a line bundle on the stack, uh, on the stack L. Uh, so when M is equal to this, it is a line bundle on R with a linearization uh, GL. So line bundles on R are just uh, trivial line bundles. And linearizations with, with respect to this group are given by uh, a character of this group. So a line bundle on uh, M is the same thing as, uh, as a linearization in the sense of GIT. Mm -hmm. And see. on the other hand, um, uh, me and Thomas, uh, like prior to that project, we checked that, for example, bridge line stability uh, also comes from this uh, determinantal construction. So bridge line stability is also given by a line bundle on the stack of uh, complexes. And uh, people who do like case stability, so like they uh, work with moduli spaces of funnel varieties, like log funnel or something, something. They check that in their case, uh, case stability also comes from a line bundle on their stack of funnel varieties. Yeah, so part one means that king stability can be rephrased as uh, theta stability using this particular L. Uh, that is correct. And for any king stability, I can find an L uh, that would give it. Okay, so uh, criterion for existence uh, of good moduli spaces uh, tells us that for uh, any stack with uh, affine diagonal and uh, finite type, um uh, there are three conditions that this stack should satisfy in order to have a good moduli space and we use this criterion to show that m has a good moduli space which is a point because uh, so it has a good moduli space and it cannot be anything else but a point because everything can be degenerated to zero so this is very similar to this uh, projective space example. And finally, a theorem by Dan Halpern Leisner says that if M has a good moduli space and L is a line bundle on M. And let me call it M straight. Then um, L semi-stable has a good moduli space. And uh, this moduli space is projective
is projective over the good moduli space of the bigger uh, stack. So again, in the earlier example, we had that uh, the bigger stack had uh, moduli space, uh, good moduli space, a point, and an open substack uh, of stable points has a good moduli space, which is projective over, over this point. And the application of this theorem is that um, L semi stable, it is the same as King semi stable uh, Q representations, has a good moduli space and it is projective. Okay, and uh, I ran out of time by now, but uh, I already told you that uh, we expect, like we have another proof of uh, projectivity that uses explicit bounds and we expect to get um, a result that looks like uh, a Stavis and Popper result. So something like this for M greater or equal to than something, uh, we get that uh, our determinant line bundle, like its power is very ample. <laughs> 